Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and uh, I'm a white woman wearing a purple sweater with shoulder length brown hair. Uh, my background is a white archway that leads into my kitchen. On behalf of Choice and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, putting the A in DEIA, Accessibility as a Necessity in the Scholarly Communications Workflow, which is sponsored by Elsevier. Uh, this slide has a white background with the webinar title and date, an Elsevier logo is in the bottom left, and a Choice uh, ACRL logo, ACRL is the Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, that logo is in the bottom right. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and the Association of College and Research Libraries that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Please note that one of our panelists today is using American Sign Language interpretation. To adjust the size of the slides or video screens, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to best suit your needs. Uh, this next slide includes a screenshot of Zoom's Q&A box. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers. We do expect many questions and we likely will not have time to get to them all, so we apologize in advance for that. But that being said, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions that you like or would like to be addressed. Please note that our presenters ask for attendees to hold questions until after their individual presentations. Once we enter the panel discussion and Q&A portion of the presentation, please go ahead and submit your questions. Feel free to jot down your questions on the side so you don't forget them. Next, there is closed captioning available for today's session. This slide has a screenshot of the closed captioning tab in Zoom. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Gwen Evans from Elsevier. Welcome everyone. I'm Gwen Evans, the Vice President of Global Library Relations at Elsevier. I'm a white woman with brown hair reaching a bit past my shoulders, wearing a print shirt and blue cardigan. And my background is my home office, but it is blurred. As a librarian with more than 20 years experience in academic libraries, I'm very familiar with assisting end users to access the materials they need in the way that they need them. But when I joined Elsevier and met my colleague Simon Holt and others on our accessibility team, I realized just how much hidden work there is on the publishing side to make not just materials accessible, but ensuring the workflows and platforms are accessible to authors, to peer reviewers and editors, as well as all our employees at Elsevier. Elsevier is an award-winning global leader in inclusion and diversity efforts for our research and healthcare communities, our customers, and our employees. Alongside our efforts in gender equity, support for communities of color, an explicit focus and training on inclusive research, and our support for global pride initiatives, both externally and internally, I'm enormously proud to work for a company that sees accessibility as an integral part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm enormously privileged to be able to turn it over to Simon Holt and our distinguished panel. Simon? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Simon Holt. I'm a white man in my 30s with curly brown hair, glasses, and a beard. I'm wearing a dark blue jumper. Um, my background is blurred and it's my home office, which is also my spare room. Welcome to post-pandemic life. Um, I'm the Disability Confidence Manager at Elsevier. My role involves working with both colleagues and communities to identify and to help break down barriers for people with disabilities at work and in research. As a blind person myself, I know from personal experience the positive difference accessible materials can make to somebody's learning experience. And, uh, and conversely, 
the impact inaccessible materials can have on someone's ability to fulfill their potential. I don't think I need to explain why accessibility is important. The fact that you've all taken the time out of your day to attend this conversation tells me that you already get it. But suffice to say that according to the United Nations, 15% of people in the world of working age, so that's people between the ages of 16 and 64, have a disability or long-term health condition. That's over a billion people worldwide, and no doubt a significant proportion of the communities you each serve. Many of these individuals will have accessibility requirements, and it's up to us to make sure that they have what they need to access the materials they need for their learning. That's why we want to, do, to dedicate to, that's why we want to dedicate today's conversation to ensuring that A for accessibility is part of every library's DEIA mix. I'm sure everybody here wants to ensure that all the materials for which they are responsible are fully accessible to all of the people who use them. However, how to do this is another question entirely. I'm pleased to welcome our three speakers, each of whom have both personal and professional experience in this area. Each speaker will give a brief presentation to outline their own areas of expertise before we move into a conversation, which will feature some questions from Gwen and I, and then some audience questions. Since some of the speakers will be using screen readers, please could I ask you to put your questions in the Q&A after all three speakers have finished. Now, on to our speakers. Stacey Scott is Accessibility Manager for Taylor & Francis and Chair of the UK Publishers Association's Accessibility Action Group. She previously worked at the Royal National Institute of Blind People, RNIB, as the um, Bookshare and Publisher Relations Manager. As a blind mathematics graduate, Stacey has both personal and professional uh, vantage point on accessibility, equality and inclusion matters. Sheila O'Moran is an Associate Professor at the University of Michigan, where she holds a joint appointment at the Performing Arts Technology Programme in the School of Music, Theatre and Dance and in the School of Information. Her research focuses on human computer interaction, especially interface incorporating um, haptic and auditory feedback. Elizabeth Henry is, um, is uh, instruction and reference e-resource librarian at Gallaudet University. Being deaf since birth, she was born and raised in Colorado using, um, using uh, uh, cued American English, also known as cued speech, um, learning American Sign Language, ASL, later on in life. At Gallaudet, she wears multiple hats, ranging from reference to instruction uh, to acquisitions. Being responsible for Gallaudet University's library's online resources, um, she is responsible for ensuring that the resources are accessible not only for deaf people, but for deaf blind as well. I'd now like to hand over to Stacey, our first speaker. Thank you, Simon, for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Stacey Scott. I'm a white woman in my 30s. I'm wearing a purple dress with a black shrug that keeps falling off. I'm wearing sparkly earrings and necklace for Christmas, and there is a gold and green Christmas tree over my left shoulder. That is my background in my dining room. It's a real honour to be part of this panel on behalf of International Day with persons, for Persons with Disabilities coming up on Saturday. Um, I just Simon has already outlined my position. Um, I'm currently the accessibility manager for Taylor and Francis. Simon also mentioned that I myself am blind. And so I just want to take you through a bit of a journey looking at, from my own perspective, what education was like and what access materials was like 
10 years ago or just a bit over when I was at university compared to what it's like now. So Simon mentioned that I am a mathematics graduate, but I didn't start off there. So when I went to university in Stirling in Scotland, I initially started off doing subjects such as uh, sociology, psychology and education and Spanish. These were subjects that I was very much interested in, um, but I found the method by which I had to access the written content portion of the subjects to be uh, an absolute nightmare, to, to, put, it, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, so this was you know, 15 years ago, and everyone else in my, my, my dorm, my flat, was, was out partying and down the bar. And I was sitting scanning page after page after page, journal after journal, and most of the time finding that I'd scanned it backwards or upside down, or it hadn't come out correctly, or I'd scanned the wrong one, or it didn't have the information that I needed. It was absolutely exhausting to have to do that. And although the university did provide somebody to support you with that, they simply didn't have the capacity to take on the amount of work that would be needed to support somebody studying social sciences. Because if I'm looking at how much time it took me, and I'm only one person, and there were several, many other people who needed support as well for various different reasons. So I struggled along with that. And so I could have done two of one of two drastic things leave which was something that I, I was very tempted to do, but I didn't have a plan B. So I decided to make a plan B. My plan B does seem rather uh, non-conventional. Non I decided to take a subject up where I didn't have to scan every single thing that I needed to know. And so I went into a maths lecture one day and I sat down and I listened and I enjoyed it. It was something I was actually able to follow when they were just describing and, and writing out what they were doing on the board. When I went up to the maths lecturer at the end of the session, I said I really enjoyed the subject and I was looking to take it on full term. Could I speak to them about it? And they looked at me like I had just said, hi, I've got three heads, is that okay? And they said to me, no, you can't do maths because that's your you're blind because I had a cane in my hand they said you're obviously blind um, and maths is too visual you can't possibly do it and I said well I did it at school and I think I did okay and so how about I do one semester you offer me all the support you can and if it doesn't work out I'll drop out and we won't say anything else about it so they agreed and they gave me wonderful support I was allowed to have somebody employed um, through a government funded scheme, I was very fortunate, um, who could read the content to me because it wasn't accessible back then either. I typed out all of my answers and for the really fun parts such as graphs, um, I, I thought that I would absolutely fail the graph theory portion of my degree. But I went in with a positive attitude and some plasticine, some coins, some beads and some pipe cleaners. And I made fantastic graphs and had a lot of fun. And these were all then transcribed and drawn onto paper exactly how I'd done them with my pipe cleaners, and my bits and pieces. And I actually that was one of the highest grades I received was for graph theory in mathematics, which is something I never would have thought possible. And I couldn't have done it without the support of the, the people around me with the support of my lecturers and the people that were in class with me and helped me get the information that I needed. But it, again, as I mentioned, it wasn't perfect because it wasn't accessible, but certainly I found it much easier than, than the lengthy and uh, overwhelming amount of scanning that I had to do. And I must confess, I did get to go to the bar now and again, just now and again. So that's looking back 15 years or a bit more. Looking now, look, if we look at how things are now, if I was to go and do that degree again, I would be able to access what, things like EPUB files and e-readers. I would be able to sign up to platforms like Access Text Network, Bookshare US, RNIB Bookshare, where platforms of, pu publishers have put nearly a million books on the UK Bookshare platform alone and over a million on the Bookshare US. I would be able to read that with an electronic braille reader or I would be able to read it on my phone using text-to-speech 
And the idea that we can do this and, and many other things, we can have access to a world of content. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. We still have a long way to go. We still need to fix the access to STEM subjects issues. So science, technology, engineering and maths, which is something I work on, which I'll move on to in a second. And we still need to fix the adding alt text to all images and various other things as well. But I, I do look back and I feel that we have come such a long way. And it's, it's great. It's great to be able to say that. And perhaps, you know, I would go back and do another degree. Um, if only the fees weren't so high, they're much higher now than they were. Um, looking forward at the next five to 10 years, I, I would like to think that we would see further development in STEM subjects, as I mentioned, and better AI solutions for image descriptions. Um, we're going to see a lot of changes due to the Marrakesh Treaty and the European Accessibility Act, which essentially makes the Marrakesh Treaty allows people, publishers and makers of content to share their content across borders to get it into the hands of people who, who may not be able to get that hold of that content due to financial reasons. It also allows partners and publishers to share content within countries where copyright would have prevented them doing so. The European Accessibility Act basically sets in line a load of standards which says to publishers and platforms, you need to be accessible and you need to do it in the next three years. And so it's really exciting to see actually this being mandated, which is a very important step in making things accessible. So the final thing that I'd love to see, and I think this is hugely important as well, is I'd love to see lived experience at the forefront putting accessibility on everybody's table, having the people who live the consequences of the, the products that we put out there. People with disabilities should be leading the way and everybody I'd like to see behind them. So that's me in a nutshell, and I'll hand over to Sheila. Thank you so much, Stacey. I'm just going to set up my... Um, So my name is Sheila O'Moran. Um, I am a professor, as um, Simon said, at the University of Michigan. I'm middle-aged, I'm white, um, I um, am a braille reader and also use um, speech for uh, reading content because I'm, I'm blind. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about today, this is a presentation that I gave uh, a couple of years ago. Sorry. There we go. Uh, this is a presentation I gave a couple of years ago to the Association of University Presses. And um, what we did was we ran a little uh, survey uh, that I didn't think many people uh, would respond to. And so uh, I put out this little survey online and I got 111 respondents, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for um, blind and visually impaired people, that's actually quite a, a good response. And I was interested in um, learning about the state of the art, this would have been about three years ago, in people's uh, approach to accessing materials. So I'll just quickly um, go through this little presentation. Um, and so it's kind of like zooming out from the very practical um, uh, talk that Stacy has just given. This is kind of looking big picture. So. So in this presentation, uh, we asked about basically four different areas. Um, first was really to ask about the kind of choices that people made at the time of, of purchasing or obtaining eBooks. So we were interested in discovering what por formats people preferred, where they found their um, electronic uh, materials, and what applications did they use to access those materials. So what we found was that people really preferred to use HTML or ebook formats because they preserve the heading structure of the text. And that makes it much easier to move around easily within the text because you can sort of skip by heading uh, and get around much more quickly. So you're not dealing with just a long um, continuous document. You actually have some ways of hierarchically accessing uh, material. Most people obtained their eBooks um, 
through Amazon or Apple. And this population was fairly mixed. So it wasn't all academics. So a lot of people were just obtaining electronic materials just to read them. Um, and people use a variety of applications to read their, their materials. And it kind of depends on often on where they get them from. So, you know, if you buy stuff from the Google store, you probably have to read it in Google Play and so on. So, um, and sometimes people have to use many different applications, sometimes up to five applications. You might be using Procrest or um, Apple Books or and so on. And each of those, as well as having to, you know, coordinate it with Braille or, or, or a screen reader, has its own set of shortcut keys. So you often have to learn all that as well. So it's not exactly ideal. The next set of questions had to do with how people felt about navigating through uh, ebooks and so on. So we asked about just generally moving around in the book um, between the text and, and the various parts of the book and specifically about um, index, in, using indices, indexes. So people in general said they had difficulty in moving around in the, the actual book apparatus, moving between the contents and the main text, the main text and indices, um, refer references and so on. And not many people use indices because they're so difficult to use. But lots of people said that if they were available, they would. So uh, that's an interesting thing to note. And the next set of questions had to do with sort of technical aspects of accessibility. Um, so one of the questions we asked here was, are you able to tell before you obtain a book, whether, you know, when you're looking at it in a library or on a, on a website, whether it contains accessible features or not? That was one question. Do you annotate your eBooks? And if so, how do you do it? And then finally, are long and short descriptions of images and, and figures helpful? Do you find those useful? So what we discovered was that most people Only um, about two thirds said they could find any information at all about whether publications were accessible before they downloaded them. Um, but a lot of people said they really would like to have this um, this ability to know a were there any kinds of features already in the book and b what kind of features were there there. Um, oh, sorry. Most people don't annotate their ebooks, but of the people who do, they tend to do so in a separate file in a text file. And a lot of people actually copy and paste the text or part of the text into a text file and then annotate there. So they might add, you know, markers like star, 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 or so whatever their way of working is. Um, and they just generally find it easier to do that than to try and annotate within um, a platform like Procrest. But good news, um, the people said of the 111 people who responded, 102 said that they do find um, the alt text descriptions, long short alt text descriptions of images and figures helpful. So that really says that when you know publishers and, and the industry in general gets behind a project and really delivers, people do appreciate it. This last um, section was interesting. What we were interested in, in looking at here was people's confidence in the material. We asked about confidence in formatting, in content, and in particular, their confidence in page numbering. And this is because when you read material with a screen reader, it's often reflowed. And so you can't necessarily find um, the page numbers. Uh, at the moment, I'm actually preparing a manuscript myself for MIT Press. And it is a real pain to have to have to find page numbers within other texts so that I can quote directly. I often have to get cited help to do that just to check whether the reflowing is actually veridical or not. Um, and so that, yes, that, that def definitely is something that um, probably could use some attention. So people tend to trust the confident, mo uh, be most conf confident in the content. Uh, nextly, they were confident uh, in the formatting and the least, the thing that they had least confidence in was page numbering. Uh, and as you can see here, only 50 people, even 50% uh, of people even um, 
though people had most confidence in content, only 50% of people felt they were actually seeing the same kind of content as their cited peers uh, laid out and, and you know, structured in the same way. So in, in summary then, and this was really, you know, a first pass, I think there's certainly um, ev evidence that doing a much more comprehensive survey around these topics would be very helpful and might, you know, serve to guide the future work in the area of, um, you know, the industry's approach to making things accessible. But the three things that sort of, uh, the couple of things that came out here was firstly that um, working, the work that has been done on alt text, long and short form alt text uh, for images and uh, figures has definitely paid off. This is something that people really use and they really appreciate. And then there are sort of three areas where uh, uh, effort could probably be usefully extended. So the first would be creating more seamless ways to move between different parts of a book so that you could actually look at something in an index and come back to the main chapter or move to a reference and come back or so and so on. Um, then providing ways to verify page numbers. Um, so finding out what the actual page number in the published form of the book is um, so that you can then use it as, as you should in, in um, preparing your own work. And then finally, this one was important, providing a means for people to verify before they download content, whether it's accessible and what kind of accessibility features um, it contains. And so that was um, what I wanted to present today and just sort of put it out there to see how, what people think uh, and to see you know, whether this, these kind of recommendations might be something that it would make sense to um, follow up on, on in the future. And with that, I would like to hand over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Sheila. I uh, very much appreciate uh, everything you shared with us in your presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Henry. Uh, I would like to provide an image description. And I'm a white woman with blonde, brown, brownish hair. Uh, I have black earrings. I'm wearing a purple cardigan and a black shirt. And I have a black background and blinders to, uh, for my window uh, to my right. Uh, I'm sighted and I'm also deaf. So I am working with two phenomenal interpreters here in our presentation. Uh, the first one is Gustavo Navarrete and Diana Marco. Gustavo is currently interpreting for me into English, and you have been seeing Diana interpreting into ASL uh, throughout the beginning of the presentation. I work here at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. Uh, where the majority of student, the student body is deaf uh, or deaf blind. We do have a few students that can hear that are hearing students. However, the majority of our students are deaf and deaf blind students, which means that all of our courses are taught in American Sign Language. There is no spoken English used uh, in the instruction here at Gallaudet. And I would like to talk a little bit more about deaf and deaf blind individuals and how oftentimes people assume that deaf people, deaf, deaf people are monolith. And the fact is that we're quite diverse. Uh, some are good lip readers, some prefer to use American Sign Language, some prefer to use cute speech uh, for American English. Uh, so everyone has different preferences in terms of communication and how they interact with people who don't know American Sign Language. And the same goes for deafblind folks. They are not a monolith. A lot of people assume that deafblind people uh, simply cannot see or hear anything, and that is not uh, the facts. Uh, some people have some auditory access. Some people have some visual access. Uh, some people are, are born deaf and sighted. However, with age, depending on the condition, they might lose their vision uh, in adulthood. So each deaf or deafblind person has their own respective individual needs for accessibility. Some need large print. Uh, some use uh, Braille readers. Um, some will find their own way to navigate accessibility. I think what's important is to inquire about each individual need and what preferences each individual user has uh, to be able to accommodate those, because there's not a one size fits all for all uh, in terms of accessibility for deaf and deafblind individuals. Some uh, like to use Zoom text, some prefer a Braille reader. 
uh, you'll never know what to expect uh, when it comes to accessibility. And I um, really, I learned to simply follow the lead of the user and what is their preferences in terms of accessibility. Some deafblind students that I've worked with um, are deafblind, however, they rather use their speech rather than use American Sign Language. So you never know what you're going to encounter in terms of needs for accessibility. So it's something that we have to consider uh, that there's different modes of accessibility. You might think that you have one offering, however, you need to have multiple offerings, offerings in terms of accessibility because you don't know what to expect. Uh, this community here at Gallaudet University uh, is uh, one of the best things that we do in terms of accessibility, specifically for uh, sighted deaf uh, individuals, is always have captions available. That is crucial for the deaf community. And in addition to that option, it would be nice to have uh, captions that uh, you are able to edit the color of the text, the size of the text, and the background uh, for contrast, because each individual will have their own preference and of how they would like to access the captions. If you only provide one type of caption, it can be limiting for some people. Uh, for those who are deafblind, um, I have worked with one deafblind individual and they have specific types of formats that they like to follow. Uh, like Sheila mentioned, some like plain text for uh, some don't like PDFs. Um, uh, uh, not scan documents in PDF uh, are oftentimes not accessible uh, because the structure within the PDF, documentable PDFs are not accessible and they're not able to be transcribed into Braille readers. So these are important things that we have to take into consideration, specifically when we're looking at, P at PDF accessibility for those who are deaf blind. One thing that I've learned is that um, Galeret is pushing to uh, make all of our PDFs accessible, and that's a project that we're undertaking at the moment. Uh, so uh, anytime we have a PDF, we have to make sure that it's accessible when you're putting it into Blackboard. That is our learning management system. Uh, and we use Blackboard to see whether that PDF is actually accessible or not. And if it's not, then we have to take that file, uh, put it into uh, Adobe Acrobat, uh, professional and that program has a tool that allows the PDF to become accessible and then uh, that is the process that we go about and it's not an easy process it is quite complex and it's quite challenging if a lot of the materials are not accessible uh, it's a steep learning curve uh, mind you and I can see and understand why uh, deaf and deaf blind folks or even blind folks struggle with scanned PDFs because scanning the PDF uh, it's not a way of making it accessible. It's, you have to always double check the precision of the scanning to ensure that the figures, the letters, the text, the images, because uh, there's so many factors within a PDF file. Uh, also, the hierarchy of the document uh, there so that are part of PDFs. Uh, so it's important to take all these things into consideration when trying to make PDFs accessible. And with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience working with different vendors when it comes to accessibility. Uh, three salient points that I would like to mention. One is, uh, I remember one story where I was working with a vendor. Uh, we started uh, having a subscription with this company. Later on, they told us that uh, a specific streaming video that they had set up uh, and to be a user told us that a video uh, that they have tried to use through this company, the transcript was on one side of the screen and the video was on the other side of the screen and it came simultaneous where you had the video and the transcript uploading simultaneously. That was hard, challenging for sighted uh, deaf people because if we were to look at the transcript and read, we would miss, miss what was happening on the video or vice versa. So we couldn't do both at deaf, deaf, blind uh, side of people. And that was, I contacted the vendor and I said, is there any way that we can add uh, PAP captions? Uh, it's great that we have captions, but can we do layover captions onto the video? The vendor said that that was not possible. And uh, with that, uh, we said that we had to cancel our subscription because it was not accessible to our study, a student body. 
So it is important for us to check all these levels of accessibility and ensure that they're friendly and accessible to our community. And if they're not, we are not able to sign up subscriptions with different vendors that are not able to adjust. Another story, which was more of a positive story, I was working with one vendor uh, for streaming captions for a video. The quality of their captioning was not great. It was okay. However, the user told me that they weren't quite satisfied with the quality of the captioning. There was room for improvement. I decided to reach out to the vendor based on the feedback and I inquire about uh, how we can improve the, you know, the, the captioning quality. And they were very open to feedback. They accepted and took all of our feedback and they inquire about what were our needs, what were the visual needs of the captions for them to be accessible. Uh, we sent them and gave them Netflix as a great example of great options because you can actually modify the appearances of the captions. So we pointed to Netflix uh, for them and the company, in fact, went ahead and replicated what Netflix does. Now, for uh, anything uh, that we uh, stream with captions, we are able to edit the captions to our preferences. So that was a great experience with that vendor. And the last story I have, I recently had one um, vendor, um, their PDFs were not accessible. And as a sighted person, I didn't think about it at that point. I didn't realize that their PDFs were not accessible. So I, someone told me, I tested it. In fact, it was not accessible. I contacted the vendor and I told him that we need to make those PDFs accessible. And they told us that they were in the middle of a transition from uh, regular PDFs to accessible PDFs, and they were in progress and they were working on it. However, as soon as they were finished, they were going to let us know that they were accessible, but they said they were in the middle of that process. And I contacted their accessibility office, and which it was impressive to me that they in fact had an accessibility office. That was great. I sent them, uh, I sent them a PDF that I wanted them to uh, make accessible, and they did, and it was just a phenomenal experience. And I think it is important to engage with the customers and the vendors, specifically with the customers, to see what the accessibility needs are. And I do highly recommend that. We don't offer just one type of accessibility. I think it's important to be inclusive of the diversity of accessibility needs out there because each individual will have their own preferences and their own needs and whatever and to ease their comfort. Um, so it's important to listen to your consumers. And that's what we do here at the Gallaudet Library. And with that, I have concluded and I would like to hand it over to Simon to lead us into our Q&A. Thanks, everybody. Three really good and insightful and quite different presentations there. Um, what I really like is whilst the perspectives being offered were quite diverse, um, there were a few themes that I think that cut through there. And so bearing in mind that my first question is about the use of language. So I think as kind of librarians, but also as publishers um, and as a community, we often think um, about the importance of language in order to encourage people to stop feeling people feeling intimidated and to make people feel that materials are for them and to help them in their learning. So in this context, um, would any of the panelists want to talk about the importance of language in order to create the right service environment to encourage people in their learning and to encourage an inclusive, accessible environment um, as opposed to language that um, sets up barriers and can make things more difficult. What, in your opinion, is the right language to use and perhaps the less right language to use? Um, I don't know who would like to start. I should also say to everybody else, Thank you for being patient and diligent and not putting your questions in the chat before, but we would really appreciate if you now wanted to start putting your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. And Elizabeth here, I'm happy to yep. start uh, with that question, if you don't mind. I think for the deaf community, we uh, like we like specific terms like deaf or hard of hearing or hearing loss rather than other terms that are used. 
And the deafblind community likes the term, the combined term of being deafblind as an identity. This is the cultural identity. And the reason I mentioned that, because I still, still see folks using terms like hearing impaired, which is not very much accepted by the deaf community, or mute. Uh, hearing impaired is a pathological term. It's a medical term that feels diminishing to the deaf community. So I do encourage folks not to use hearing impaired impair or mute, rather use deaf, hard of hearing, someone with hearing loss or deafblind. Anyone else want to add to that? So Sheila, um, I think for blind people, um, it's there's a sort of a generational split. I mean, I don't mind being called blind, but then I'm sort of, of a, an older generation. Um, but then again, there's a variety. So that you know, visually impaired sort of came from the medical community, um, and so I don't know, blind, uh, low vision. That, that there would be the the different things, but they're not the same. Like somebody who's blind is not low vision; they have no vision. So that there are there are distinctions to be made. That's great. Um, Gwen, would you like to ask the next question? Um, I can tell there are a lot of questions in <laughs> in the Q and A. I can't see what they are, but maybe you might want to pick one. Yes, this is Gwen. And the first question, actually, I'm I'm going to send to Elizabeth. It is, I would love an explanation of why our panelists are describing their appearance and background during introductions. I've never heard that before on, on a Zoom. I'm absolutely happy to answer. So uh, I, uh, as we introduce this to this group, I think I thought this was important. And this comes from our deaf blind community. Um, as uh, deafblind folks, some of them have low vision and have uh, uh, some accessibility uh, in terms of their sight. Oftentimes, they appreciate understanding what visual context is happening around them, especially in Zoom. Um, this is uh, this started. Uh, very much so to become the norm to make things accessible to those who are deafblind, deafblind students. We describe our images or image uh, description so they know who we were talking to and what they look like and what they're wearing, etc. It's just for access. Super, thank you. I'm going to ask the next question to Stacy. Um, so the question is, what are the economics associated with making the instructional materials described accessible? And are there good models for covering costs? Thank you, Simon. Um, it's certainly a, a big question. It's a great question. And I think the answer is, is a bit like, how long is a piece of string? Um, th the reason I say that is because depending so one of the key things actually I should start with is it will always be less expensive and more economical to to start by putting accessibility features into your content as it's born as it to make it born accessible it will be much more affordable to do that than to go back and retrofit accessibility into a catalog so some of the features that can affect how affordable that is can be things like um, are you using PDF or EPUB, for example? So in my view and in, in a lot of people's view in the accessibility space, EPUB, is, particularly EPUB 3, is the far more accessible option. And so if you use EPUB 3, um, you can much easily, much more easily render your content. You can put more structure and navigational headings. You can put image descriptions or text in there. Now, how long, how long this long this will take and how much this will cost, again, very much depends on how much is needing done to that particular document. So actually, if you're starting from scratch and you're just going along and you're producing a document and you're putting in your own headings and your own alt texts and stuff, then it doesn't actually need to cost that much. And one of the ways that Taylor and Francis has approached this is to actually start building it in, as I mentioned, to make it born accessible. So we are actually doing a lot of work with our authors right now, and we've produced um, an entire toolkit of instructions, examples, 
of how to put their own alt text into documents. So we receive EPUBs, so they're automatically already a bit more accessible than the regular PDFs. Um, we typically encourage headings throughout um, in order to better be presented for navigation and we encourage them to provide it with, as I said, all text. And so actually when that book gets to us at Taylor and Francis, we can run it through a, a particular tool that we've got and the tool will pick up all ebooks that come through and it will flag any that don't have any alt text and we can go back to the author and say hey you know you've got your alt text can we discuss it and that's actually going really well and because we're building it in it's costing a lot less however when we did a, for a, a forecast looking back at our back catalogue We've got 160,000 books and we did a forecast to say, well, how long and how much would it cost us if we wanted to make all of those fully accessible with alt text? It was something like 40 million. And had we have started doing what we're doing now, so now all of our content is an EPUB, can be, it can also be it had an HTML or PDF if people prefer, and we're building more and more alt text into our workflows. So that is becoming, a, that is much more affordable and it's doable. And we're looking at, you know, we're going to we're going to go and put image descriptions into, I think it's something like 10,000 of our EPUBs, and it's going to cost about 3 million, but that's a lot better than the 40 million it's going to cost us to put it into all of our backlist. I don't think that's something we can do, so we're targeting our key products, the products with the most downloads so that we can support as many people as possible. But had we been able to do it from the start, it would have been a completely different story, and certainly looking forward, doing it making it born accessible content, it is much more affordable than retrofitting it. I hope that helps. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, Gwen, do you want to take the next one? So uh, this is more of a comment, but it, it uh, I have a question following on to that. Um, as a faculty member, I would welcome a checklist for actions I can take to ensure that my course materials are accessible to all my students and actions I can take in my synchronous Zoom classes to ensure that all my students are set up for success in their learning. Um, so uh, maybe Elizabeth would like to answer that, but I would also like to, again, as I have joined the publishing side versus the, the librarian side, is what do you think the implications are as institutions or libraries move into library publishing or creating content that that should be born accessible? You've just described, Stacey, a, a pretty complex and expensive process. So um, Elizabeth, perhaps you would answer the first part of that, the, the best practices checklist is, are, or does anyone else have any um, recommendations for, for, con for those sorts of uh, best practices? Of course, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan, for that question. Um, so I don't have a checklist at the moment, but one thing that you can do is check with your accessibility uh, office at your institution, at your university, uh, if they have any sort of instructional design department or a department that focuses on uh, quali the quality of education or online education, I would suggest to reach out to them. And um, they perhaps may have a checklist. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are many checklists available online that you can use. You are also welcome to email me and I'm happy to share resources with you. But I would, the first step I would check with your institution to see maybe the Office of uh, Students with Disability or Disability Support, Instructional Design, they might have something that is already readily available to you. This is Sheila. Um, I was also going to say, I think a lot of it, um, coming back to the question around Zoom, a lot of it has to do with making sure that students, particularly students um, who have reading uh, requirements uh, for adaptive uh, text, if you can send them any materials in advance, like slides or things like that, then they can actually have a, uh, a be able to read them because you can't, especially if you're using a screen reader, it's hard to listen to a class and read the slides at the same time. Um, and in the same way, you can also try to remember to read the content of your slide or at least summarize it rather than just assuming that everybody's going to consume it while you're talking to the slide. Um, so that's another very easy way that you can make the course accessible. So building on that, 
uh, we've had a question from uh, Liz here. Hi, Liz. Which are, um, what are your recommendations regarding sharing visual presentations, uh, materials like slide decks to make them most accessible um, to the audience? So I feel like you've started to answer that question, Sheila. So is there anything more that you'd like to elaborate on that um, since we've had it asked specifically? Yes, this is Sheila. Um, yes, I think, I mean, providing the same kind of things as you would for images and figures like alt text descriptions, they don't necessarily have to be on the slides, they can be in the notes. And, and you can do these for things that, you know, if you have, if you haven't the time to do it for everything, the things that are uh, critical for the, the, you know, understanding of the class, they would be the most important ones to do first. So like if you have a graph that's showing something that somebody really needs to understand or some equations or whatever, make sure that they're actually readable. Um, so just, yeah, the sort of same kind of things as we suggest for publishing in general would be also equivalent or, or the same for preparing slide decks. That's great. Um, Gwen, do you want to take the next one? I just want to mention, this is Gwen, I just want to mention that we, we are sorting by most upvotes. So if there is a question you would particularly like to be answered, please upvote it. Um, and so we have a question from William Straub regarding PDF accessibility for better serving users who are non-sighted besides testing PDFs with the JAWS screen reader, are there other tools we should be using to test? I've heard that maybe five or more tools may be used. Which are the most important? Hi, it's Stacey, shall I take that one? Okay. So, um, I, I, five tools is um, is a lot, um, but I think I mean certainly there's there's two ways to to look at your PDF or to check your PDF. So when we talk about visual impairment, and this goes back to language, you know, we we can say sight loss, visual impairment. There's a whole variety of different things out there, but it's a spectrum, and so you will have some people who will identify as blind who have useful vision. And so what they need actually is very good color contrast, good font, um, and they may use magnification software. So it could be like supernova. Um, and so it's very important to consider obviously those factors. And then when it comes to text to speech, there's of course, there is of course JAWS, which is, I think we would probably reasonably say the most commonly used. The other one is NBDA. Now, at Taylor & Francis, we test with both JAWS and NVDA. And the reason we do this is because NVDA is open source. So it means that it can be downloaded by anyone for free, whereas JAWS has a reasonably large price tag. And it's typically afforded by people who are able to get student grants or support loans or uh, you know, sustenance programs for their, for their work. And so NVDA must always be a key testing tool because it allows anybody to, act, anyone can have access to that particular screen reader technology. Um, and so it's a very good tool to use when testing your, your PDFs. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna ask this question here because it has had a lot of upvotes. So here we go. Um, one question that I have to anyone on the panel, I understand that you consult vendors and other contacts about accessibility for materials. However, um, does anybody use open education resources at your institution and um, has accessibility been a smooth process? So I guess that would be for Elizabeth or for uh, Sheila. Elizabeth here. Yes, we do uh, advocate for using uh, uh, open resource educational resources, but do remember that we I reached out to one company to see if some of the materials were accessible. And I got sort of an iffy answer from them. They said some of them are, some of them are not. 
and that it would require more testing. And I think that it is important to ask to see whether actually the user believes something is accessible and uh, whatever device they're using, uh, rather than me as a sighted person, I always should go to those who have the lived experience to see if something is accessible and user-friendly to them. Um, this is Sheila. Um, and yeah, and again, it's the problem that always happens with open source things, which is that um, everybody's problem is nobody's problem. So there's no sort of focal point for sort of checking anything. It's just like put it up there. It's for free. And then what happens then is it puts the burden of accessibility or finding accessible versions of things back on the individual. And it's nice to try not to do that because we don't expect sighted people to have to find their way into their publications. So um, we shouldn't really be expecting people who need access to have to do that either. So the challenge with open source is that where you don't get the benefit of infrastructure that might kind of take that load away from the individual. And I would just add um, from my previous experience as the executive director of the Ohio Link Consortium, which has a very robust OER component um, created by teams of faculty across the state. But because there, there was no way for, for Ohio Link or the, the sort of organizing um, group to audit all those materials. As you may be familiar, OER are all, all, often a collection of materials put together, not a single you know, EPUB or PDF. The burden was on the faculty members themselves, the teams or the creators to ensure accessibility. And it's not their, uh, it, it, they're not experts in that. But I, I did find it was a concern. But as Sheila said, it it was um, uh, it it was there was no infrastructure to enable sort of scaling the audit. I would say. Hmm. And okay, so. This one as well from Julie has also received a lot of votes. Um, so understandably, the emphasis has been on uh, hearing loss and sight loss. Um, but could you also speak to physical disabilities involving movement um, and limited use of hands? Um, so yeah, does anybody want to talk about those particular aspects. I wish I could comment on this, uh, but I myself don't have a lot of experience or knowledge on it. We do have some de deaf individuals who have additional disabilities, whether they are wheelchair users, um, that we have here on campus or deaf individuals who also has a cerebral palsy. Uh, but none of those students have come uh, to us to look for accessibility resources. So it is definitely a phenomenal question that we need to consider, but unfortunately I don't have an answer. Hi, it's Stacey. Um, I just want to answer in the context of the platforms that I mentioned earlier, so the likes of Bookshare US and Bookshare UK or RNIB Bookshare. So when when we're looking at that, they're, quite often they're, they're working to, well, they're always working to the, the latest copyright legislation. And what the latest copyright legislation essentially means is that, in this context, is that anyone with either a visual, cognitive or physical and i use the word impairment if you know that's what they use um can have access to the, that content and so if you have a student with any physical disability that inhibits their ability to hold or read a book in print then they will be you know that is absolutely it's then within their right to through the copyright act certainly in the uk to contact the publisher and get that in an accessible form or they can join Bookshare and Bookshare US and get access to like I say well over a million books um, and it, they have the legal right to do so. Thanks very much. I'm conscious that we're now at the top of the hour so I'd like to thank all our panelists um, for 
your insights and most importantly thank you to you the audience members for your engagement i've been really heartened by the amount of really thoughtful questions um that have been asked and i'm sorry we just weren't able to answer more of them really um i'd now like to pass back to sabrina who i think has got a few closing remarks great yeah this is sabrina thank you simon i'll just echo simon and say thank you so much to sheila elizabeth and stacy for taking the time to present and speak with us today thank you to gwen and simon for moderating the discussion and thank you to our interpreters gustavo and diana and thank you to our attendees for your engagement with your questions and your comments um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from CHOICE and the Association of College and Research Libraries with a link to the recording. Uh, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. <laughs>